Um, share screen. Here yes, you now you've got a thing here, 387-492. Is that a different number? Is that the same number we've had? And can, you can't join, right? Yeah, let's see if I can join. I think somehow you have to do something to be a host, and I don't know what that is. Well, I probably can't join because I'm equal to her. Yeah, try it. I had it on do not disturb. Try available. Oh, that's yeah. good. Yeah, that's available might help. now. Yeah. Try it again. Yeah. See if that. Uh, Are there other settings? No, that was just that was just, just uh, this nonsense. This little, yeah. Uh, yeah. Somehow I don't think it knows you're the host. Yeah. Which is, uh, I think, you know, if you click on the participants, it'll show yeah. you as host, your host. Yeah, you're the host, me, you're right. So people should be able to join. You can't join. Well, it's, re oh, here. Okay. Well, it's so apparently recording anyway. Uh, I don't suppose I can join because I'm equal to the host. Um, but, uh, well, all right, this is what usually happens. We'll get the recording, I'll put the recording afterwards and forget about the live stream. It is making recordings, I see that happening. And, uh, I don't think I've ever seen any projection and any conference ever work without about half of, without about half the talk ending up like this for not be working. Yeah, exactly. That's the usual. This is how it usually goes. Tomorrow, I was going to talk at DEF CON, just kept cutting out the video and audio at critical time. Yeah, I joined right away. Yeah, you, you joined. You were able to join. Okay. Yeah. Well, then I can post this number. Good. Then you might be on the road. All right. Let me, so the number is uh, up there. I create seven. Okay. Can we get feedback? Um, Anybody no? else able to join? Join. You just go to Zoom and put in the uh, yeah. screen share. Once he, once he shows you it's all. Uh, yeah. Three, eight, seven. Good. So it's just she can't join for some reason, but that's if remote people can get in, that's the important thing. Four, five, three, four. Good. So now we have to. Oh, you're the Nexus? I was, yeah. Good. Okay. He muted himself. I'm posting it on Twitter and I'm going to put it on my webpage and hopefully some people will be able to find it. Yeah. Do you have to sign in to Zoom? Because I don't normally mm -hmm. sign in. Yeah, I just hit join meeting and typed in the number. Maybe I am doing something. I don't know if I ever sign in. Mm -hmm. It should work just like that. Anyway, anyway, uh, some people may eventually find it. Oh, somebody think. else just joined Nina. Yeah. Oh, good, good. Who's Nina? Oh, cool. Yeah, nice right. work. Um, huh. Okay. Is it the Zoom app? Yeah. I'm going to put yeah, it on my webpage. Anyway, we'll have the video, so that's, that's what they'll see. And all this will be on the video now. Oh, I can try to trim all this off. It's just it's very difficult to edit videos in Google. But I may make the exception that we'll have 20 minutes of this. It made it a little easier. Earlier, I started making playlists of your videos. Maybe I'll offer my yeah, yeah, services to, okay. to help you clean right, so, things up um, a little. Join. I'm putting it right here. Wait. Just a meeting ID. Uh, it's up there in green. It's the green one. Uh, eight, seven, eight, seven, eight, eight, seven, eight, the very top. Three eight seven. Eight nine two. It's three eight seven eight nine two four five three four. Good. Good. Eight nine. Uh, three eight seven eight nine two four five three four. Good. All right. Now I'm putting it in here. Yeah. Shake it so that. There it is. Way up there in the green. Three eight seven eight nine two four five three four. You'll never forget that. Yeah, it's great now. Four five three four. All right, I'm putting that on a web page where some people might be able to find it. Mark, good. Well. I think you might as well go. Don't worry about the remote people joining because okay. I think they uh, All right. <clears throat> we have someone else. Dot. Oh, yeah. Uh, you can mute them. I hit mute all. That's usually yeah, good because I, otherwise they think their microphone is They'll come in. Shy, shy. Yeah, I did it already. Yeah, it's already muted all. Good, good. That's, that's the thing. Otherwise, they always talk oh, and irritate one another. I think all a right, bunch well, of people join with their microphone turned on and they don't know that. I'll stick this down here. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, let's see. Right. We get a uh, full screen there. How's that look? Oh, that looks pretty good. I should probably turn off some of these lights. Oh, the lights can, off. Okay. We can That'd have dim lights. Hopefully that will. Uh... Yeah, we can have this. Okay. Great. Thank All you. right. That's not too bad. Yeah. All right. Thank you for coming. Well, thanks for having me at uh, at your class. All right. This what the, this is cryptography class, it right? Is. Cryptography okay. Cryptography. Good. I'm not a cryptographer, so I don't know anything about cryptography. Just came here. <laughs> well, so uh, let's see. Now you guys are all studying various uh, aspects of computer security. 
some of you just cryptography and others of you like a whole variety of things. So any of you guys go on the dark net regularly that you are willing to admit? Anybody use Tor ever? Anybody know what Tor is? Some arms, some hands go up. Good. Okay, cool. All right. So what, what I'm going to talk about is uh, something that's interesting to me and I hope it's interesting to you and that's Darknet Investigations. So uh, first I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. Who am I? I am uh, have a military background in my family. Some of these slides, the, uh, the letters are, I try to make them really big because I hate it when they're slide presentations and the, the words are too little. So um, anyway, I, ha I spent a career as a senior executive in IT security, application development and data center operations at large Fortune 100 organizations, financial services organizations. I was a senior vice president of IT security at Putnam Investments, which is a multi-billion dollar uh, investment management firm with a huge number of mutual funds. And I was in charge of all of IT services. Our parent company's data center was on the 96th to 99th floor of the World Trade Center on 9-11, and that was the data center that went down that day. That's a picture of our data center blowing up. And so I was responsible for the operation that recovered us and our parent company on that day. And uh, I also was a senior vice president uh, executive in charge of data center operations and security at Boston company, Shearson Lehman American Express. Um, and before that, a programmer analyst and legal analyst at the Department of Energy. And I got my PhD at Northeastern. Anybody here at Northeastern University? Yeah. Not to be confused with every other university called Northwestern, Eastern, this and that. It's out in Boston. So. <laughs> And I also studied uh, digital forensics at Boston University Medical School, studied forensics, um, and have a master's from Boston University in information security and computer science, and I studied languages as an undergraduate. Okay, and these are some of my publications. So I didn't know what it meant to get a PhD, but I found out. When I got in the program, I was like, oh my God, you have to publish things. So these are some of mine I write about. Cyber terrorism, the dark net, network security, um, criminal networks, and mutual criminal assistance treaties. And these are some of my things. And I also write online applications. And these are some of the applications as I've written. One is a, it's called MLAT.is. It's an online tool for law enforcement and others to discover mutual legal assistance treaties, which are criminal treaties that countries use around the world to help each other out on criminal investigations. All right, are you guys, any of you guys from a different country? Everybody here from, where are you from? Uh, born and raised in Bulgaria. Born and raised in Bulgaria, okay, Bulgaria. So Bulgaria has criminal legal assistance treaties with a number of countries. And that is very much of a, bears on this topic because they're used mostly for joint surveillance, online internet surveillance. And so that's what that tool does. And then I wrote another tool that helps analyze DNA mixtures, which is a different forensic discipline for the Department of Justice. And I also have a nonprofit called Each One Teach One. And uh, myself and a bunch of other technology executives help kids and everybody to learn to code. So that's some stuff about me. And I collaborate with some other collaborators uh, at the Darknet Research Center and also at Alameda County Sheriff's Office Crime Lab in their digital forensics lab. So I work in their digital multimedia evidence section there and I collaborate with them on research and training. And this is a little map because sometimes I lecture around the world and I picked this one from a lecture I gave at uh, in University of Portsmouth, England a few weeks ago, and they did not know where San Francisco was necessarily. Okay. So, let's see. So, if you guys studied the dark net, the deep net, the surface web, yes, no? Sort of. Sort of, yeah, okay. So, um, just to review, 
Uh, everybody gets confused because people talk a lot about the dark net, the deep net, you know, your grandmother talks about it. What is she talking about? Who knows? So I like to review that, you know, the deep web is way bigger than the surface web or what we call the clear net, which is where most of us spend our time online, right? And uh, that's because it's unsearchable, but mainly legitimate content as far as we know. The dark web or the dark net's a totally different thing that is reached with special tools. So here's a deep web. What are some things that make the deep web uh, non-searchable? Anybody know? Any ideas? Yes. Uh, from what I remember, it's stuff that's just not useful for the general public, like just information about random animals, for instance, or about what? Like uh, about yep. animals or really obscure research data. Well, that's a very that's a very good idea. That's right. It's it's uh, content that, for example, our websites they're hidden behind VPNs, virtual private networks, right? So you go out on the surface net, you can't get into somebody else's VPN. Does CCSF have a VPN? Do you guys log into CCSF? Okay. Faculty probably has it. Everybody has a VPN. Anybody work for a company that has a VPN during the day? What company do you work for? Apple. Apple, okay. And so can you log into their VPN? Exactly, but the general public can't. It's all kind of content behind there. Nothing like deep, dark, and scary about it. It's just not public or whatever. So websites behind VPNs is a big part of the deep net. Sites behind paywalls, right? You got to pay. That's not going to be indexable or searchable on the surface net. That's part of the deep net. Pages that are returned by queries only are not indexable. When you go to a website and then you submit a query, queries a database and comes back, that's also not part of the surface net or password protected sites. So these are all part of the deep web. Darknet's something totally different, right? You guys may have studied it. Some of you guys have been on it. So this is a picture of TOR. Anybody know what TOR stands for? TOR is an acronym. Oh, I didn't know. There you go. The onion router. Excellent. T-O-R. The onion router. Some people argue that it's the onion routing. It doesn't really matter, actually, but it's all kind of the same thing. Based on onion routing, a cryptographic system that was patented by the Navy. So uh, some of the special tools uh, that you can use to access the darknet are Tor. I put it in big letters because that's like a big one. But there's others. There's Yondo and Yondonim, which is Java non-proxy, JAP. A lot of people know that. There's Freenet. There's I2P. So it's not just about Tor. OK. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the Darknet and what it is and how it works. And then I'm going to talk about some investigations, some very famous and not so famous investigations that have been done on the Darknet. So I do a lot of uh, academic research with a group of researchers on network security and the dark net. And I also work on a practical basis with law enforcement to help chase and catch criminals on the dark net. So I do a lot of different things on different aspects of the dark net. And in order to catch criminals, law enforcement needs to know and understand how it works. So if you guys, anybody here work with law enforcement? Yeah, where do you work? At? Oh. In the sheriff's office or the PD or? I work with the American Medical Response Type Pass Program. Okay, perfect. So, yeah, exactly. Perfect example. Or in your future work, if you work in InfoSec, quite often you're going to work with law enforcement. So, for them, understanding how Tor works and how the Darknet works is critical for them to attempt to try to catch criminals on the Darknet. So, just to, to stop for a minute here. Um, it seems like not a lot of people use Tor or are familiar with Tor here. So Tor's, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what Tor is, but the one, people that know about Tor mostly know about Tor Browser, which is an internet browser. And Tor is, you know, can kind of broadly be deemed like a collection of privacy tools, right? You guys studying privacy at all here? And the other side of privacy is surveillance. So a lot of times we talk about studying Privacy, well, what we're really talking about is surveillance. They're like kind of two words that are used, and also a lot of other things. So people like to protect their privacy, and Tor provides privacy-protecting tools, basically. 
and one of them is Tor browser. And there's a lot of reasons that people would want to use Tor. So I think a couple of you guys said that some of you use Tor browser from time to time. Anybody here use Tor browser? And what do you use Tor browser for? I haven't used it for about five years. I'm not sure it was the browser, but I used Tor. Okay, yeah, you it remember super, it? Super, super slow. Slow, kind of like, exactly. Most yep. stuff, uh, vanilla, the vanilla sites didn't watch anyway. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. Yep. And how about you? What do you use Tor for ever? I was using it mostly for school um, because I was doing it for projects and everything, but for the life of because it was a, you know, a privacy renowned tool. Right, exactly. Well, so if you're out browsing on the internet, you, maybe you want to keep your personal information private, right? Is anybody harvesting your personal information when you're out on the internet? Everybody, everybody right, exactly. So like every time you go out there, everybody's harvesting your information. What do they do with that information? Anyway, anybody know what they do with that information? Market research, right. They use it. They sell it, and what do you get in return? Free stuff. free stuff. Everything free, right? So you get something, they get something. So some people think that's a bad bargain, other people think it's a good bargain. That's a big discussion. But the bottom line is that sometimes when you go out on the internet, you don't want your personal information harvested. And so you use tools like Tor to protect your personal privacy. So if I'm going to research how to poison somebody, I might not want to browse there on Firefox or Chrome because why? Law enforcement or somebody's going to come and see that I'm like browsing out of poison somebody. So that's criminal. But maybe I just want to like, you know, uh, maybe I just want to log into the, you know, the New York Times without, you know, uh, having a subscription or something. Or I just want to search something that I don't want to have searchable in my browser. Or maybe I'm a big user of Tor. Law enforcement's a huge user of Tor. And we'll find out that Tor was invented by the US Navy. Our military and intelligence are some of the biggest users of Tor. They use it to protect their identity and anonymity and it keeps them safe. So the bottom line is there's a lot of really legitimate uses for privacy tools. There's nothing inherently wrong with privacy tools like Tor. But when you hear a lot about the dark net and there's a lot of crime on the dark net, that's true too. So one thing that you wanna keep in mind is that, well, there is a lot of crime on the dark net, the dark net is just a synonym for using certain tools that there is really nothing wrong with and there's a lot of legitimate uses. I use Tor every day for my research. I use it to read periodicals where I don't have subscriptions and all kinds of things like that. Okay, so that being said, what is Tor? So here's some pictures of some different things. We've got a picture of Tor browser up there, right? And we're gonna find out why Tor browser is slow. It has high latency, which means it's slow. Tor is doing something different from Chrome and Firefox when you use it to search things. It's protecting your identity by routing you through different relays all over the world. So that's why it's a bit slower. And we have a picture of Hide and Root, which is dark net, dark website that does a lot of illegal activity. And so, yeah, so Tor is actually a suite of 31 applications of which the best known is Tor browser, but Tor browser is only one confusingly. Tor is also a suite of libraries of code. This one, Tor, is also something called Hidden Services, is one of the applications of Tor. I put this in big, big green ring, because this is what most people think of as the dark net. Ooh, scary place, the dark net, is Tor Hidden Services. And here's a picture of an actual FBI takedown site where they have gone onto the dark net and taken down a dark net site. That's Tor Hidden Services. That's another meaning of Tor. And here's some frequently asked questions. You might have never known before you came to class tonight that you were going to have these questions. But Tor stands for the onion router. Who said that? It's disappeared already. Exactly. This was invented by the US Navy in the 1990s, which is kind of amazing to people because Tor is a lot of people think of Tor the dark net. And they're amazed to find it was actually invented by our military intelligence, the US Navy. It's a picture of Paul Cyberson. He's a senior mathematician at uh, the High Assurance Laboratory at the US Naval Research Laboratory, and he's one of the inventors of Tor. And he's also my thesis advisor, and I work with Naval Research Laboratory all the time on my research. And uh, the Navy took out the patent on Tor 
in 2001. And in 2002, the first alpha release of the Tool Tour was released. Now there's a bunch of you have heard of the Tor and the Darknet. Back in those days, nobody had really heard of it. And they actually used the term Darknet up until a couple of years ago to mean something a bit different. <coughs> Anybody know what the term Darknet was used to describe until a few years ago? It was used to describe peer-to-peer -peer file sharing systems. So a few years back when Pirate Bay and Napster was like all the thing, the dark net was that scary place where people went to violate the DMCA, right? And download stuff. Because I'm sure none of you guys would go out there and download anything, right? Oh, I gotta take down my peer-to-peer -peer file sharing system here, but right. So a few years ago, that was the dark net. Now everybody's completely forgotten about that definition. And the darknet is like Tor. So it kind of changes all the time. In 2006, the Tor Project, a nonprofit organization, was organized in Massachusetts by Dingledine, Matthewson, and Lumen. And here's a picture of Lumen, one of the original founders of Tor. So all of these things are Tor. So when, when somebody says, what is Tor? It's all these things. It's an organization. It's a library of code. It's a set of tools. It's all those different things. OK. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how Tor works so that when we get to these exciting investigations, uh, you guys can understand them a little bit. So Tor is uh, a series of relays. So there's 10,000 volunteer relays around the world. Another thing that Tor is a Tor organization consists of some employees and staff and contractors around the world based in Massachusetts, but around the world. And it's also a series of 10,000 volunteer relays or servers around the world that bounces your traffic all over the world. So this is a picture up here in the top left-hand corner that shows that when you go on tour because you don't want all your personal information harvested by you know, uh, Zoom that just captured all my personal information when I downloaded them. Uh, and it bounces your traffic among three proxies, we call them proxies, right? And then it bounces you out, Bob, to your destination URL. So if I use Tor to download Zoom, I mean, I could theoretically do that, I'll be slow, and I'd have to use a series of other precautions to actually make that work, and possibly I might be blocked by Zoom, but theoretically I could have done that, they wouldn't have gotten my personal information that they probably just captured. Okay, so that's kind of how it works. Question? Uh, are you, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I fully understand this, but would Tor be more efficient if you used it inside a virtual machine to be like double sure that your privacy is not being taken over? The well, that's a really good question. There's actually a number of steps that are important to take when using Tor to fully protect your anonymity. Using it inside a virtual machine would accomplish some things, so people could do that. Um, but there's other precautions that you need to use when you're doing tour. For example, you can use tour to go to Facebook, you know, and log into your Facebook account. What might be a problem with that? Anybody, can anybody think of what, why you might not be anonymous if you log into Facebook through tour? After you log in, pretty much. Right, when you get to your destination, you're, you're, you got your personally identifiable information, including your name and clear text. So tour, we're gonna, Look at just briefly how it works technically, but not dwell on it a lot. But it also encrypts your traffic and it wraps it in layers of encryption, which is why it's called onion loud and get it. Onion wraps it in layers, get it. Anyway, and it wraps it in encryption, layers of encryption from your desktop. But when it comes out of the exit relay at the end, it goes in clear text to your final destination. And obviously, if you're connecting to Facebook, that traffic of yours is being transmitted in clear text out the end. So Facebook knows who you are, first of all, and everybody else does too. Questions? Is, uh, is the encapsulation what slows it down? The encapsulation is not what slows it down. What, what slows it down is a topic of a lot of debate, but in a nutshell, it's the fact that it's, your traffic is being bounced among relays all around the world. So say you're going to connect to uh, CCSF's website and say that's hosted on servers that are right here. It's probably not, it's probably on off my servers, but let's just say that it's hosted here. Maybe it's just hosted down the hall, right? So I log in right here, my destination is down the hall, but if I go on tour, my traffic maybe bounce first to Australia, then to Moldova, then to South America, 
and back up to the server here. So that's what's giving you your latency, mm -hmm. is that it's bouncing among other things. And you know, when, when you first log into Tor, establishing your first session is slow, typically slow meaning it can take 40 or 50 seconds to set up that first connection. Once it sets that up, it's a little faster. Tor builds up circuits and tears them down every eight to 10 minutes. So it's performing this in the background constantly to you know, keep even more private and you know, prevent attacks. But yeah, so those are some things about Tor that are... A quick question about my concern. Sure. Do you know whether anybody that's running, how shall we say, large sim kits of nodes under their controls, like maybe nation states? What? Nation states or, running some of Tor's relays? Well, or, you know, place internationally in strategic locations. Well, you know, traffic is observable at the exit relay. So here, you know, this person on the end who's running this exit relay, they're getting like millions of Tor users' traffic coming out of their exit relay and they can observe it. And people have observed the traffic that's on the exit relay, and they found that it's dominated by nation-state spy organizations around the world. So, yes, absolutely. One thing about the relays is the list of relays is published and public to the extent that those people reveal their identity. The whole list of IPs is public. It's downloaded constantly. It's fully available. But you don't necessarily know who's really running those relays. But in reality, we know that tons of nation states are running those and they're observing them. But the truth is that while Tor has a lot of vulnerabilities and we're going to go over some known attacks, it's a large, well-funded adversary like a powerful nation state has the resources to perform realistic attacks on Tor and get your anonymity. But in general, Tor is very hard to break, which is why Tor has been so successful and why it's so widely used around the world, is that on a widespread basis, Tor has not yet been broken. On, however, there are many known vulnerabilities and attacks. That's why there's so much crime out there. And as you observe, there's lots of nation states, for example, our own, possibly. We wrote it, why not? <laughs> well, exactly. Well, and another thing about what, think about why the Navy would have released this to the public and be collaborating with people. They own the patent. That's what I was just going to say. If we wrote the program, wouldn't we have written a backdoor in it so that we could basically siphon whatever information we wanted? Well, we could. We no. could have, but they did. <laughs> so Tor code, as you may know, is published. It's fully available at all times out on the web. It's fully transparent. Everybody can look at the code, it's well known. So it doesn't have a back door. That's the question that law enforcement asks 50 times a day, calling up Tor Project. Is there a back door? No, no back door. <laughs> so, so there is no back door. And we know that by many means. But that doesn't mean that it's impenetrable. But the thing about it, if you remember, that it was invented initially as an application to keep our military safe, our Navy. And one of the principles of onion routing is that there's safety in numbers, that the more people you have participating in the network, the more anonymous you are. So the Navy made the decision to go out and release the code to the public in order to grow and proliferate the number of relays around the world because it keeps our troops safer. So that makes strange bedfellows because you get all kinds of people running the relays, but in a way, it doesn't matter because the more there are, the less any one person can see, can break it. That makes sense. Okay. So, right, Tor Browser, the best known. It's uh, 10,000 volunteer servers worldwide. We call them relays. Somebody here said that you guys are running a relay. Did you say you're running an exit relay or no, I somebody? I like three days, but I can understand the heat. You can send the FBI knocking on your door. GMCA notices. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Did you get a call from the dean? What are you guys well, doing? I, I read it on my own cloud. Show. Oh, AWS. But even so, I decided to knock it off. It's an experiment. Exactly. Yeah. It's not for the fan of heart. Yeah. It's nothing illegal about running a tour exit really. But as you can imagine, that you know, of the people running these relays out here, 
you got a huge amount of criminal activity coming out of this relay. All the tra traffic is exiting out of this relay. So lots of people run tour relays. I run tour middle relays but, and guard relays. But if you run an exit relay, you're going to get visited a lot by law enforcement. Nowadays, law enforcement pretty much knows about tour. So they realize that, you know, they catch a criminal and they got their IP address and they zero it down to you and they come knocking on your door. Oh, my God that you're just running a tour agent relay, you have nothing to do with whatever criminal activity may be coming out of that relay. But there's still new law enforcement learning that every day. So it's not for the faint of heart, definitely. Tour hidden services is uh, something a bit different. And it's what's, as I mentioned before, this is what most people mean when they talk about the dark net. They're not talking about tour browser. They're talking about hidden services. Because this is where Criminals can remain anonymous. So this is a pretty confusing picture that is surprisingly less confusing than most pictures of hidden services. But just in a nutshell, you don't have to understand all of this. Really, all you need to take away is that it's complex, which you know undoubtedly you will. But the idea is that like if you're up here a client, like this guy up here, and he wants to order some tarts, right? And you got this hidden service down here that's selling tarts. Or maybe this is narcotics, you know, but we'll just say it's tarts. And uh, so this guy doesn't want anybody to know his identity. And probably this guy doesn't want anybody to know his identity either. He doesn't want the website to harvest his information. He doesn't want them to know who he is, and they don't want him to know who he is. Right? Anybody know some famous hidden services are based right here in San Francisco? Silk Road. Exactly. Silk Road. Right. Who ran Silk Road? Anybody know? Anybody remember? Albrecht. Ross Albrecht, right. Wife Shack. Yes. So this Ross guy, it was at the Glen Park Library, which is like a 10 minute walk from here. Exactly. Yeah. That's where the bus took place. I was very worried that he was one of my students. No, he wasn't. That's I right. was from MIT. I said, boy, I sure hope this guy isn't one of my students. I'll have trouble explaining that. Yeah, I actually had a friend who happened to be in the library at the time the FBI came down the guy. Oh, that's no. fabulous. So you, so then you know how the takedown happened, right? A little bit. Fascinating. Story a little. We're going to talk just a little bit briefly about that takedown because it's a fascinating story, but you're absolutely right. It happened at the Glen Park Library that's very close to here. A series of agents went in the library, and after they figured out that it was Ross Ulbricht, they uh, all went to a table where he was sitting and working, right? Anybody know this story? And two agents staged a fight and pretended that they were boyfriend and girlfriend. They got in a fight and they got closer and closer and closer to Ross. And so Ross, he like, he turned and looked away at, at these people fighting with each other. The girl across from him, who was looked like a teenager, was actually an FBI agent at that exact moment. She grabbed his laptop because they had to capture it open well he was logged into the hidden service otherwise they wouldn't be able to get that website but just click continue okay so say okay so basically in a nutshell if this is silk road and this is a, a buyer of narcotics up there the uh you know the buyers tour uh instance you have to use tour to get to a hidden service it selects a rendezvous point, which is a, a virtual relay up top. Down here, Silk Road is constantly broadcasting some introduction points, which are intermediary nodes. And then they publish that to a hidden service directory, which is another node. A lot of nodes involved here. And then the, the uh, buyer up there connects to the hidden service directory, finds out where the introduction point is. They both go to the introduction point. It's kind of like going down the dark alley, like out back and saying, meet me out back down at the end of the dark alley. And when we get to the dark alley and we meet, then I'm going to tell you where to meet me to buy the drugs or whatever. So then they meet at the introduction point. They agree on where the rendezvous point is. And they finally build that circuit, which goes through a number of tour relay hops represented by the little machines there in the middle or whatever. Now, this site could be a newspaper site or WikiLeaks or something where some journalist is trying to like anonymously drop some information. The reality, based on a lot of research, is that the darknet is actually completely dominated by crime. It's not that much legitimate activity. There's a number of reasons for that, but we want to realize that there are legitimate purposes, but we talk a lot about the crime because that's what dominates here. 
So yeah, so this is how Silk Road and some other famous hidden services work. Known attacks, we don't have to spend a lot of time on this, but there are a lot of known attacks. One of them is not a backdoor, although that's a FAQ, frequently asked question, as you asked. Um, there's, you know, attacks like the predecessor attack, the bad apple attack, the sniper attack, many of them depend on traffic correlation. So traffic being observed at the exit relay and trying to match that up with traffic coming out of the, uh, the guard relay on the beginning end. Um, a number of other t attacks. These are all sophisticated attacks. They're usually very difficult to perform. Um, and so <coughs> bottom line, there's no really simple, easy way to break an attack tour at this time. I talk about some different attacks. You guys study autonomous systems in this class? Anybody know autonomous system? IXP, Internet Exchange Points. When uh, internet traffic crosses legal borders of countries, it goes through something called an internet exchange point. Every country has IXs and IXPs, internet exchanges. Countries that conduct surveillance usually perform their surveillance at the IXP as it enters and leaves the country. There are a limited number of internet exchange points for every country. For example, Iceland has six, has only six paths in and out of the country. So not hard to do surveillance on that country. This is a little map of that. And we talk about some realistic, successful darknet techniques that law enforcement uses that do not involve advanced um, technological attacks. And these are like time and correlation. So Jeremy Hammond, who was also known as Anarchos, right? Anybody study Anarchos? Remember him? What did, what did Anarchos get arrested for? Anybody know? Anybody remember? That's true. Big hack he did. Right. It was the Stratfor hack. Yeah. Yeah, he was finally nailed on the Stratfor hack, which was a big hack. Nobody knew who he was, a guy named Anarchos. He was out on the dark net, Anarchos, you know, like Dread Pirate Roberts. They caught him, they finally unmasked him. It was Jeremy Hammond, he's in jail today. Okay, so dark net investigations. Here's some famous dark net investigations, just that you guys might have heard about. Anybody know, who's this guy up at the top? Anybody recognize him? Russ Ulbricht, exactly. Just looking like a regular guy down at the Glen Park Library. They didn't have, can't imagine this was a guy who was evading law enforcement for years. Famous, what was his pseudonym? Anybody remember what was? Dread Pirate Roberts, exactly, he's all over the news. Turns out he's just down the street here from you guys. They searched for this guy the world over. And Russ Ulbricht was actually caught by timing correlation attacks. So he successfully used the dark knight used Tor hidden services for Silk Road, but he was taken down by a time and correlation attack. The same as Jeremy Hammond for the Stratfor hack, he was taken down using time and correlation. They actually physically observed, they figured out who he was. Actually, it was actually an IRS agent that figured out who he was. Anybody read the story? The IRS agent who used surface net, net, surface net good old fashioned police work and figured out, linked him to an ID named Frosty, but they then identified him and they put his house under surveillance and they watched and collected evidence of exactly when he came out of the house and when he went back in and when he connected, and then they watched connections to Tor and IRC channel and they proved in court that there was an exact correlation between when he came in and went out and when he went in the Glen Park Library. So just think about that next time you're like, you know, on IRC chat or something like, the problem with TOR is mainly not that people can break it technically, because it's very difficult to break technically from many viewpoints, but that the user makes a mistake. It's complicated. Someone was asking me a few minutes ago, oh, if you should use, you know, a virtual machine, or some people sometimes say, why not just use a VPN, which is a really good question. But it's very hard to be perfect and do everything perfectly all the time. You guys may learn that in this class. And that's how we catch a lot of criminals on the dark net. The user makes a mistake. They use their real identity. They include unencrypted information in a communication stream. Eldo Kim is a famous dark net criminal. Yes? Um, sorry about the previous one. Would he have been safer if he had used IRC and Tor at his home also? Uh, Jeremy or Ross, you mean? Yeah, one of, one of them. Would they have been safer if they used it at their home? Yeah, so they couldn't say that every time he leaves the house and goes to the library, that's when he's on IRC and tour. 
Well, what happened is he would be on IRC and tour at the house. He's just like you and me, right? I mean, yeah. our, I'm logged into my computer like 24 seven. I get on the bar and I get off the bar and I'm like, you know, I'm on it like all the time, everywhere, around the world. I just can't do without it. And that's the same as him. Probably a lot of you guys are the same. And so he was on it at the house and then he just briefly logged out while he went down to the library and then he logged in again. Okay. So he was at it in both places, but they just, they watch him go out, come in again. Okay. Right. Um, Eldo, Eldo Kim, anybody remember him? Harvard student, right? Supposed to be smart, Eldo? Oh, Eldo's in jail, serving five years right now. What happened to Eldo? Anybody remember him? He's a Harvard student. He didn't want to take his exams. Oh my God, so he used Tor to commit a crime. Anybody remember what he did? He called in a bomb threat to Harvard. He didn't want to take his exam. He wasn't ready. He was afraid his parents would be upset if he didn't get an A. One bomb threat? And you get 35 years for that. Five years. Five, Five years, okay. right. And he caught in the bomb threat. Here's a picture of the bomb squad at Harvard. Snowy December morning. I was taking a final exam that day. I heard about this on the news. I actually felt a lot of sympathy for him. <laughs> I did not want to take an exam that day either. Yeah, so Eldo, you know, got caught. Eldo used Tor, unbreakable anonymity. And we didn't talk about the encryption part. We're going to talk about it a little bit. But, um, but he got caught, he made a mistake. And so Eldo, you know, was in his dorm at Harvard and he got on tour and he was, you know, not a dumb guy. He used Gorilla Mail, he got an anonymous email address. He emailed the president of Harvard University, the head, chief of police, all these people. So he was gonna blow up Harvard. They had to spend God knows how much money, you know, getting all the dogs out and stuff like that. He made a crucial mistake though. Anybody think of what? Mistake he might have made sitting in his dorm, gets on tour, gorilla mail, mails in a bomb threat. What do you think? Yes, dorm Wi Fi. Dorm Wi Fi. Brilliant, exactly. If anybody wants to do this, they should definitely consult you first and think about <laughs> what they're doing. He was on his dorm Wi Fi. That's Harvard University Network, right? He's on the Harvard University Network. Oh, I don't know if he just crossed the street to the Obon Pan across the street, he wouldn't have been on the Harvard University Wi Fi. But he was there, were actually 128 people logged into Tor. Harvard's a big Tor, Tor users there at the time. So the way they caught Eldo is they started going down, they got the list of 128 Tor users, they went down through the list and they knocked on the door. And each person they said, We know it was you. And when they got to Eldo, he said, You caught me. Oh, Eldo. No. No. So yeah, he got five years. Actually, he got probation. Now he's going to be eligible to reapply to Harvard after a while. So not that bad for him. Didn't turn out that bad. But that gives you an idea. Correlation, fingerprinting, narrowing down possibilities, matching details. Another big way that we catch people on the dark net is by uh, a lot of it involves physical deliveries, right, of narcotics and other contraband. I don't even know what kind of crime is committed out on the dark now. What kind of things are for sale out on the dark now? Anybody know? Not that anybody here is, you know, in the market or anything, right? You got your weapons, right? Counterfeit money. Hitmen available. A hitmen for hire out there. You got your narcotics. What's that? Human smuggling. All that stuff's available on the dark net, right? But a lot of the stuff that you purchase on the dark net requires a physical delivery. So uh, at Alameda County, we collaborate with a lot of law enforcement agencies around as a unit at SFO that sniffs all packages coming into SFO. So we routinely uh, set aside the packages that are identified as containing narcotics. They're open, the narcotics are verified. They're rewrapped, they're delivered. Then using, uh, People who are assisting law enforcement at the delivery points, which may be um, mailboxes or other delivery points, we observe and physically identify the people picking up the packages. So next time your aunt sends you a teddy bear through SFO, remember that thing's been examined carefully. So physical delivery of things is one way that people are apprehended on the dark net. Okay, let's see. Cryptography, this is a cryptography class, so I felt I had to put in something about cryptography. I'm not a cryptographer, so 
I don't really know too much about this stuff, really. Tori uses cryptography in a lot of places. It's referred to as a cryptographic uh, system, basically. So some of the places where Tor uses cryptography are discovering the network, creating a path in the actual communications, and in hidden services. These are just some of the areas. And cryptography is used in a lot of different ways. So I'm just going to touch on some of them briefly. So there's the original onion routing cryptography that is in the patent that is, you can read it on the internet today and go to the patent. In this slide, I included a link to the actual patent. But at a high level, Tor uses asymmetric cryptography to establish the one-way authenticated encrypted channel. But what's the thing about asymmetric cryptography, right? You guys study cryptography. What, is, what are some differences between asymmetric and symmetric in terms of you know, how, how they are to use? Slow, right? We talked about Tor being slow to begin with, right? That's latency, asymmetric, slow. So typically you use asymmetric for, exactly. And then you use symmetric for your payload sometimes, right? And that's exactly how Tor works. It uses a fast symmetric cryptography after establishing it. So we're not going to go into a huge amount of detail on this, but just so you can get your money's worth, uh, network discovery. So there are nine directory authorities in Tor. These are trusted nodes by well-known individuals to Tor that keep a directory of all of the nodes. And when you connect to Tor, when you go on Tor browser, you establish an SSL connection. The public keys are compiled into the software and the, your client uses one of the keys to establish an encrypted connection to a directory authority. So that's as soon as you click on Tor Browser logo, which you can see here, anyone who uses Tor knows this is my Tor Browser logo. You can look at it for a minute at the end. That's what happens basically as soon as you click on it. Um, that the client downloads the consensus from the directory authority and checks for signatures on it, and also requests the consensus from the directory authorities that pick the entry, middle, and exit nodes and then obtain their public keys from the directory mirror, and it uses RSA 1024, RSA 1024 asymmetrically. Path selection, I just reused this graphic because I think it's kind of a cute graphic, but it doesn't really have anything to do with circuit building in a way. This is actually a graphic that's used in an attack about clock skew, fascinating attack wherein every single computer in the world has a unique amount of clock skew compared to the atomic clock, whether you realize it or not. All of you are individually fingerprintable merely by the clock skew of your machines, believe it or not. And anyway, so it then matches up the clock skew. But uh, path selection circuit building, you have to agree on a session key with your different relays. And for that, they use a, an HMAC, Diffie-Hellman in this case. Okay, so it's a different use of cryptography that's used in Tor. And then finally, in your browser communications, in sending your actual content uses AES-128 as symmetric. <coughs> All different aspects. And Tor Hidden Services, we went over a little bit, but it uses a combination of all of these three. Okay. So now, let's look at some dark neck crime that we've been fighting. Anybody recognize some of these guys? These are some famous Tor dark neck crime. Yes. Oh, I just pointed to Snowden. Snowden, right. There's one. We got, uh, let's see first, we got Mubarak, right? This is one of the first widespread known uses of Tor. This is a picture of Mubarak. Anybody know who Mubarak is? Everybody forgot. <coughs> exactly. Former president of Egypt is behind bars here, right? Things didn't work out for him. Mubarak famously shut down the internet in Egypt because he couldn't control Tor. He shut it down for a week because uh, citizens were using Tor to get videos out of what was happening. Imagine I shut down the internet because of the dark net, specifically because of Tor. Here's a picture of who's this guy? Everybody knows this guy, right? Snowden. But some of you may not know, this is a very famous picture, right? Everybody seen this picture? What does he have on the corner of his laptop here? 
tour sticker, right? That's a tour sticker. This was him in Hong Kong, right? When he had escaped, he's, uh, he famously used tour to exfiltrate a lot of his information and for various things. Chelsea Manning, a time called Bradley Manning, right? Another famous uh, act that was using tour. Anybody know what Bradley Manning exfiltrated? Anybody remember what he exfiltrated? A video of a murder. A military strike called a murder. Exactly. A military strike, which was called, and the video of this was called collateral murder. It was dubbed collateral murder. Here's a screenshot of the uh, collateral murder video from 2007. Here's a picture of Bradley Manning at a hackerspace. This is a Boston University hackerspace. See the sign behind that says BU? This is, well, I was at BU. We used this hackerspace, and Bradley Manning came and visited one day while he was on leave. This was actually taken three days before he exfiltrated his data. He works for the Navy, he comes to BU hackerspace, he exfiltrates. I don't know, connect the dots there. And he went there a couple days ago. Back to BU. Yeah. I tried to get him to come here, but he was going to BU. Going to BU. Going back to BU is really where he was going. Right, so there's another famous tour. And this is a eye chart that you can't possibly see, but it basically you get the idea. This is Darknet Crime. This is an analysis by Dark Owl of the kind of crime that's out there and sort of the proportions. We got your huge counterfeiters here. We got, and this excludes the biggest category of crime on the dark net. Anybody know what the biggest category is? Not up here at all. That's a big one. There's an even bigger one. Drugs. It's child abuse, formerly yeah. called child porn. That's the biggest category. It's not legal to harvest the, to crawl or harvest the, that, uh, those pages. So crawlers typically do not index it. There's very, very few dark net indexers. I work with a, a consortium of academic researchers and we crawl the dark net and we collaborate with law enforcement on that. But that's one of the most horrific uh, parts of the dark net, basically. Yeah, gambling, chat rooms, you got your, uh, you know, all kinds of stuff out there. I didn't see uh, like terrorists or infringers or pirates over there. Yeah, you don't see that up here. Well, you know, it's interesting. Terrorists, right? Like, There's so law enforcement either. you might have like, um, you know, you talk about the legitimate uses of tour. So there might be like terrorist chat rooms, maybe, or terrorist blogs, right? Like, I mean, you have your weapon sales, but like terrorists would you'd essentially be looking for them to do some type of blog or chat room, right? Sure, you don't find them actually out in the dark net very much. There's a reason why. The reason why you don't find them, and that's because the dark net is hard to find. So nobody goes there for like to find information. Yes. Uh, ha has this been like a, how has the dark net crime changed over their, your experience? Would, the, would you say that this has been an accurate depiction for the last 10 years, so to speak? Well, that's an excellent question. And you remember the slide that said that Tor Project was incorporated in 2006, uh, 10 years ago. <clears throat> the first instances were instantiated around 2002 and 2004. So the darknet hasn't been around, this kind of darknet hasn't been around very long. And the first studies that were done, there was a, a kid in Sweden that recorded his exit relay traffic. And he f that was one of the first times that anybody is known on the record to have studied what is on the darknet. And he found, he, he found a huge amount of um, military intelligence and intelligence nation states snooping on each other. So he contacted the Swedish embassy to inform them that their, you know, Wi-Fi was like way open and that they were like way open and stuff. And they, what did they do? They ignored him. Oh my God. So he called them again and again, they ignored him. So what did he do? He published all the traffic out there, right? Published all the confidential communications that were coming out of his tour exit really that they were open for anybody to record. He published them. So then then he like shot to fame overnight. Yes. Um, so the whole idea of tours to have like encrypted anonymous stuff 
how come these exit relay people can have access to everything and analyze it? It's a design aspect of this cryptographic system, basically. Is that whoever is, yes? It's because the servers won't take encrypted traffic. If your server is HTTP, you can't send it encrypted traffic. So the exit node, it has to be clear text. If the servers were HTTPS, it would be fine. People think Tor provides encryption, but it can't. Your server would have to. It provides concealment of your physical location, but the encryption has to be enabled on the server. Exactly. And it wraps your traffic in three layers of encrypted tunneling, but it doesn't actually encrypt your content, which is what a big mistake that people make when they're using Tor. You have to encrypt your own content. So if you encrypt your content, it's going to come out of the exit relay encrypted and it's going to be encrypted. But if you don't encrypt it, when, when, it leaves your, when it leaves your laptop, it's going to go in, it's going to get wrapped in three layers of encryption. When it goes, the first relay is going to unwrap the first layer. The middle relay is going to unwrap the middle layer. The third relay is going to unwrap the last layer. The third relay has no idea of where it came from. The first relay has no idea where it's going. You can't see that. And then at the exit relay, it, it unwraps the final layer of encryption. Now, if you've encrypted your traffic inside that, it goes encrypted to your destination. But a lot of people don't bother to do that or they don't grasp that because it's complex. So exactly, that's why it's capable, people are capable of doing that. It's a good question. Interesting, yeah. Yep. It's probably the most common misconception about Tor, I think. Exactly, that, that would be like number one that, you know, and it's confusing. It's, it's hard to understand and remember all this stuff. So it's really not that easy for an average person to use it. Okay, darknet investigation. So let's see, we're gonna, I'm gonna run through these fairly quickly, but uh, these are some famous darknet investigations for people that, a lot of people think that no criminals have ever been caught. They know that Ross Ulbricht was caught. He was actually caught using a lot of good old fashioned police work rather than breaking tour. But there've been a lot of successful darknet investigations. Anybody know these characters? Up on the screen, some famous characters. We got Nicodemo Scarfo Jr. Nicky Scarfo Jr. It's a famous legal case. He was, uh, and then we've got Aaron Owen Marquez from Dublin there being arrested. He was uh, the administrator of Freedom Hosting, a large darknet platform. We got Timothy Defoggy here, formerly head of cybersecurity for Health and Human Services, U.S. Department of Health and Human mm -hmm. Services, caught out on darknet abuse sites, and Shannon McCool, a large child abuse purveyor. By day, a mild-mannered uh, child care worker. <laughs> By night, one of the biggest purveyors of child abuse in the world, now serving 35 years in Australia. So, Nicodemo Scarfo Jr. was caught using a key logger. Anybody know what a key logger is? Key logger? Can you explain a key logger briefly? Or? How simple is that? It was like revolutionary. In 1999, it was like, woo, state of the art, like, you know, key logger, right? Key loggers still work today. A lot of this stuff still works great. Yeah, Nikki Scarfo Jr., the FBI put a key logger on. This case went all the way up to the Supreme Court. Here's a picture of Nikki with his dad, actually. Proud dad, criminal. This guy's both serving a lot of years right now. Things didn't turn out too good. That was 1999, Nikki Scarfo. Eventually he got 30 years. Then Operation Torpedo was in about 2011. Torpedo, get it? Torpedo. A lot of these tour things have like cute names, you know, like Timothy Defoggy, one of the most famous criminals. Uh, operation Torpedo was a law enforcement operation that caught um, a, a number of uh, people on child abuse. It, the administrator of some of the websites was Aaron McGrath. So I usually, I, I use part of this as training for law enforcement to help them understand how to do darknet investigations. The successful ones are two stage ones where they first catch the site administrator they then take over the site in stealth and continue to run it. And they then catch the users in phase B. So you have your phase A and your phase B. This Aaron McGrath was your phase A administrator. He eventually got 20 years. 
But just like Ross Ulbricht at the Glen Park Library, you have to seize these machines while the user and the administrator is logged in in order to run the site unknown if you're law enforcement. So this, they ran Pedoboard, Pedobook, and TB3. And they used a variety. This was a joint US and China operation. One aspect of darknet operations, they tend to be multi-jurisdictional. We work with crime agencies all over the world. This was a US-China operation. And um, this was just one of the uh, famous users. In this case, 23 were prosecuted, found guilty, and sentenced. So this is one of the early phase A, phase B, de-anonymization ones. This was used Metasploit. Anybody here use Metasploit? Yeah. 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 Famous one. Metasploit. Metasploit worked with an old version of Tor that had a flash vulnerability that was a Firefox vulnerability. Tor is actually just Mozilla Firefox. It's written on Firefox, basically, with then Tor libraries added to it. So anytime that Firefox has a vulnerability, that affects Tor. New versions of Tor plugged this download. So the criminals they mainly caught were like, people that never patched their Tor. It's like old guys with old machines and stuff. Next was Operation Freedom Hosting. This is a very famous operation. Uh, this takedown happened in 2013. This is a picture of Aaron Owen Marquez, who was eventually arrested for running a number of child porn and other sites on Freedom Hosting. And um, it's an interesting legal case uh, because he is still in Dublin fighting extradition. So even though that's now four years ago, that case is still dragging on. But Mr. Marcus has been incarcerated the entire time. This one exploited a Firefox ver uh, version 22 vulnerability and an iframe exploit. So uh, basically law enforcement was aware of these vulnerabilities and built exploits to de-anonymize the users. Then Silk Road went down. No sooner was Silk Road down and Ross Ulbricht was arrested and a few other people, then what happened? Silk Road 2.0 came right back. Too much money. It was right back. Very profitable. A lot of money involved in this. Yes, indeed. Was anybody know about Silk Road 2.0? Silk Road 2.0 was was it the same site that popped right back up or was it? it's actually a copycat site that looked exactly like Silk Road. Might as well have been the same Silk Road. <laughs> and it was run by a guy named Blake Benthal. We now know it's Blake Benthal. At the time, nobody had any idea who it was running it. Blake pulled it up. This was in 2014. This was actually a joint investigative task force with 17 different countries around the world, including Europol and Interpol. And um, it was eventually, he was unmasked as Blake Benthal. Another fascinating takedown story. But... Um, Blake lived in what municipality? Anybody have any idea where he might have lived? Just a wild guess. San Francisco? Yes. Right here. Right here in San Francisco. Blake Benthal. And Blake was another young guy. Student? Well, he might have been a student here in your class, too. I don't know. Thank God. Thank goodness. Blake, you know, they went around and law enforcement, they interviewed his neighbors and the media afterwards, you know, after this guy was caught and they were like, what was he like? What were his personal habits, you know? Was he rich? This guy's making millions. I mean, Blake Benthal made millions and millions. He lived in his parents' basement over in, I forget which neighborhood he lived in. And they said there was only one thing about him. He's just a totally ordinary kid, basically. Not rich didn't really throw his money around, but he suddenly turned up with a Tesla. <laughs> a Tesla! How much does a Tesla cost? Anybody here know? It's doing at 100. Kind of nice, right? Suddenly a Tesla appears in his parents' driveway, and Blake, regular good guy around the neighborhoods, driving a Tesla, no explanation. Well, it turned out that this was his pastime. He got caught by a very famous attack that was, it was an exploit that was developed by Carnegie Mellon University. So a lot of these 
exploits are developed by academic researchers. Virtually all of them are developed by consortiums of academic researchers. So it's kind of fascinating. And this was called a relay early attack. And uh, the phase B used a NIT, a network investigative technique that unmasked him. And Blake only got eight years because by then it was so like, you know, not the big thing anymore. Then we've got Task Force Argos Kid Club. This is Shannon McCool. This is one of the biggest, first big child abuse, child porn techniques. Uh, this is Shannon McCool, frightening story. He was a, a child care worker who specialized in infants and toddlers. Horrible, horrible crimes this guy committed. He had a huge dark net porn site with over 200,000 members all over the world. These are horrible sites where to join them. You have to create your own unique porn and then upload it all the time or else you can't have access. So we now know that Shannon Cole was the administrator, but for two or three years, it was impossible to find him. Task Force Argos was a joint U.S.-Australia-Netherlands-Danish operation that actually ended up involving a huge consortium of countries around the world because once they identified Shannon McCool, they took over a kid club website and ran it famously for a couple of weeks. At that time, deploying some network investigative techniques that allowed them to exploit vulnerabilities that captured people's identity, and then they caught a lot of the users and prosecuted them. It's an excellent question. So. What happens is they isolate, first they have to find the administrator, they have to take over the website, they have to find the servers. That's a huge tech investigation in itself. But then once they uh, capture the identities of the users, they are then worldwide. So what they do on an investigative law enforcement level is they divvy them up by country, basically. And typically they've already involved those law enforcement agencies in the US, the FBI and Homeland Security. ICE is often involved, there's a whole consortium. And then once they come into the United States, those cases get further broken down by state, and they're sent to the states. So then, for example, in California, we had a number of Operation Kid Club um, perpetrators, and they get sent, then divided by county, and they're sent to local law enforcement that does what we call kicking the door in. So the names are transmitted to local law enforcement, you know, you have, uh, you know, Zalesny is a famous one that was over in San Carlos here, uh, defendant. They find the individual's location by their IP address, and they go and stage a raid where they capture the individual. They then have to go through, they have to get a search warrant, they have to go through all the usual steps, they have to capture a lot of evidence and then prosecute them. These cases take years to prosecute. They wind their way through the courts in all 50 states, and the same thing is happening in all other countries of the world. They're being broken down by county, by state. Typically, law enforcement will coordinate these raids around the world, so the raids are all conducted on the same day. Because until that morning, all the users of Kid Club think they're good to go. They noticed a brief outage a few weeks ago for a few hours. The admin was away, and then it came right back up. Question? Would you say that uh, more, as a law enforcement perspective, more people have been found using police methods or using uh, computer engineering methods? I would say police methods. A good old fashioned police work is what we call G O F P W. More are caught that way. However, on the dark net, you kind of need more to get you know, that extra ump or whatever. So this was a combination. Typically, it's a combination of the two. What's the picture? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So one of the ways that he was de-anonymized was by um, forensic uh, evidence analysis of photographs and video. You may be acquainted with that, but that's a science all in itself. But in this case, it's really a matter of observation. He has a tiny freckle there on his finger. That's what that arrow is pointing to. You can't really see it. You come right up here and get up on a ladder and stare at the screen. But it's a tiny freckle there on his hand. And so they, you know, the, the individuals that create this stuff, their hands will show in the videos. They won't show their face or whatever. They'll show a backdrop. There's a lot of um, law enforcement who specialize in nothing but looking at these images and identifying 
things in the background. And also there's a lot of metadata in the photographs themselves. Part of how this case was de-anonymized was using metadata in the photographs to trace the location where the photograph was actually taken. So this is a picture illustrating how he was caught, one of the methods. Got 35 years. Horrifying case. I mean, the guy was a certified child care worker, specialized in working with toddlers and infants, yes. So how is it that someone who, in my opinion, did something so, I mean, just completely atrocious and, I mean, like, to me, there is no words for that, got only 35 years, but other cases, like identity theft and other things like that, get, like, sentences that are seemingly longer? I mean, that's an excellent question, which is probably a topic that's way too big for tonight. But essentially, you know, in general, crimes are punished in general by their financial impact. And child abuse is very low on the totem pole. These are highly publicized cases where you know, people wanted to make an example, and the judge and the district attorney were well aware of the media spotlight on them, but many of these cases are prosecuted every day. They get a slap on the wrist. Indeed, some of the cases that we look at later, here, Operation Pacifier, uh, people got six months probation for similar. Those were users, you know, arguably, you know, less bad than the administrator, but some of the users loaded up, like, hundreds of thousands of images themselves. So, like, how bad is that? I mean, how bad is it to load up a thousand images? How bad is it to load up 10 images? How about just one image? And these people are loading up like 200,000 images of children and stuff. It's like, it kind of boggles the mind. So anyway, that would be a brief analysis of this. Operation Pacifier, the next large case, one of the last cases we'll look at tonight. This uh, occurred in the time frame of 2014. It was a joint US Interpol worldwide um, task force. And the administrators are not household names. Ross Ulbricht is probably the first and last administrator who became a household name because Silk Road was such a big cause celebre for years. He played a cat and mouse game with the police. Since that time, a lot of other people have come in, but they were Chase Flukinger and Browning were the administrators. Lived in Nebraska and Florida. Three guys collaborated together. And they had Playpen was their website, a horrible, horrible child abuse website, child porn. And these are just a picture of just six of thousands of defendants who were ultimately unmasked and arrested. Um, the techniques used in the phase A was reverse engineering of the photographs, including analysis of the photographic metadata and other techniques. And the phase B used uh, Metasploit decloaking engine and various other techniques, essentially. You guys have used Metasploit here, right? We did. We're not aware of that, that use. Yeah. Yep, exactly. Um, over 3,000 defendants worldwide were found, over 200 arrests. So, big case. These are some local Bay Area cases. I often present, talk to law enforcement, local law enforcement in general, because we've heard so much about Silk Road, and that's kind of it there. They, interestingly, don't believe that there are that they have any darknet cases when you work with local law enforcement because they say our criminals are stupid and they're low level petty people that don't know how to use tor and they're just like you know a lot of losers or whatever and you know you have to be like smart people college students to use it so i often talk to them about a lot of local barrier cases that are in their jurisdictions here are some in our jurisdictions lucas zalesny zalesny i mentioned in san carlos 19 year old student got six months probation it's a big user of playpen jose acevedo lemus in anaheim we had users and cases in sacramento and clarksburg um silk road and ross Ulbricht and uh mount gox two Secret Service agents who were involved in the Silk Road takedown themselves turned to the dark side and uh, helped themselves to a lot of money. They themselves were being investigated and under observation. They thought they were real smart guys out on IRC using PGP and everything, but they didn't. And they're now incarcerated in the Santa Rita Jail in Alameda County. Their case is proceeding as well. 
and Blake Benthal. Aldo Kim, we talked about Aldo. Oh, Aldo, you know. He used anonymous email and Tor browser, but he, here was a case where it was caught by good old fashioned police work. Looking at your network logs is not rocket science. Do you guys ever look at network security in this class? Anyone, can anyone name a tool that is commonly used in? Wireshark. Perfect, exactly. Great, you guys learning a lot. Wireshark is a typical tool for sniffing network logs, right? And you're gonna turn up in Wireshark. I mean, Harvard University police don't have to use Wireshark. They just look at their network logs. But for example, if you were using Wireshark at the time, you probably figure out it was Eldo also, like if you were his roommate or something. Okay, so that's pretty much my presentation. I talk a little bit about it. Darknet Research Center is the academic consortium. We do darknet mapping, measurement, and training of law enforcement. We work with the American Academy of Forensic Scientists and the High Tech Crime Investigators Association and others. And then just, I thought you guys might be interested in some of the projects we do with Alameda County Sheriff's Office. We have, we create hidden services on Raspberry Pis. Do you guys do any work with Raspberry Pis here? Sure. Yep, okay. So we create hidden services and practice data extraction. We do darknet training and we use Raspberry Pis for safety and configuration uh, as well as practice. And we analyze circumvention <coughs> technology. So there's a lot of, this is classified as circumvention technology and do data extraction. So that's pretty much my presentation. Here's some tools that people use. Exonerator, exit relay eliminators that tell you if you're, if you're law enforcement and you get an IP address that's committing a crime, you check Exonerator to see if it's Tor exit relay. If it is, you're out of luck because that's not gonna lead you anywhere. And some changes in uh, Rule 41 of the Federal Rules of Evidence that allow warrants to be a single warrant to be issued in one state to cover all criminals in the united states written specifically for the darknet okay that's it that's my presentation <laughs> here's the last thing here's here's a question are there other tour like networks out there yes there are we talked about a few of them there's i2p there's Freenet, there's Yondo, Yondo named Java non-proxy. So there are a few, They're, they've been measured. They're very tiny compared to Tor, but growing. So, yes. What's your more, most memorable uh, takedown case? Mm, well, you there's so many, I'm fascinated by these takedowns. They're so interesting because they're a combination of technology and you know, a lot of times legal advances and things, and then just plain old amazing human tales or whatever. And we have a lot of other takedowns in the lab that don't have to do with the darknet. I collaborate with them on all sorts of digital evidence extraction. We do a lot of cases. Uh, we do so many cases. It's amazing how much crime is out there. But um, in terms of most memorable, I guess, uh, we de-anonymize a number of people, so it takes a lot of work, and it's always very satisfying, you know, when you reach that. I think, you know, for me, technically, some of the more interesting cases involve the more complex um, vulnerabilities. So for that reason, um, Operation Freedom Hosting that used the Carnegie Mellon attack was one of the more memorable. But, yes. Uh, how does uh, the Tor network work with stuff like the Great Wall of China, uh, the Great Firewall of China? Yeah, that's an excellent question because Tor is used in a lot of countries by people to escape uh, censorship or who uh, can't get out of their country. But so, just briefly, Tor works in those countries by proxying you through. So, like if you're in China and you're not allowed to go to Facebook, mm -hmm. then if you zig and zag around to different proxies, then supposedly the authorities will be fooled, right? Only the way Tor does it is it, it uses bridges, something called bridges, which are just ordinary Tor relays that are kept aside and not published all the time. But the problem, so that's kind of how it works. But in reality, like all nation states can discover 
all of the methods that Tor uses for circumvention. Because so, the, um, exit points and entry points in country has, that you mentioned earlier. That's one way. There's so many ways. Like, I could spend all day and talk about them. I mean, it fascinates me so. But, right, there's so many different ways. But even without doing that, they can just discover every single exit relay and then just block access to every single exit relay. They have censorship technology is another kind of fascinating thing, but I won't go into that. But there's so many different ways to censor. You can kick people back, you know, you can redirect and do stuff like that. So, so is that how, like for example, in China, that people use a VPN app to how they, and then they can use them until the government wants it. They can use a different VPN app, right? Exactly. Now, if you're a well-resourced global passive adversary, what we characterize as a global passive adversary in you know, the literature when we're analyzing different threat models and attack models, those more sophisticated nation states know how to block tour, discover all the relays quickly, and figure out new ways. Less well-resourced, less smart nation states don't know how to do that yet. So, you know, Tor is an effective tool that's used as an anti-circum, anti-censorship device in many countries. And the State Department has been funding the Tor project for years for that exact reason to help develop the circumvention technology. Yes. Um, so we talked about Silk Road and Silk Road Two, um, but I heard that there's just tons and tons of these markets on the Tor network. Um, what sort of, like, how do they get caught or how does law enforcement choose like which ones to go after? <coughs> Is it when they get more popular? So many dark nets, so many criminals, mm. so many dark markets, right, exactly. I mean, you have a huge proliferation. These cases are resource intensive and they take highly trained engineers and technologists that are in very short supply in law enforcement circles. So they are, you know, they're really kind of the exception. And, you know, like to your question about how criminals who do such terrible things get only 35 years versus people that do, you know, financial crimes get like 187 years or something, you know, it's that they, some people who are cynical will say that some of these cases are simply pursued in order to make a big splash. So we all remember this summer, there was a very big darknet takedown. Anybody remember what this summer's big splash was? Hansa, right? Hansa Market and Alpha Bay. That was the summer. Attorney General gets up and announces that they did a big darknet takedown. All of us are wondering, does he even know what the darknet is? He's <laughs> reading from the thing in there, you know? But, uh, right. So... And they're typically multi-jurisdictional. They typically take many, many months, if not years, to do. As you can see from just talking about some of the phases that you know they all take like a long time to do and require a lot of coordination. So, you know, the the another truth about the dark net in these cases is that they're, you know, they just proliferate. No, no sooner do you take down one than you get a whole bunch of copycats. There's like Silk Road 7.0 out there. There's like hundreds of darknet markets. We analyze them on a daily basis. Me and the researchers that I work with analyze and look at these markets. So, and so it's a very good question. Probably another topic for another day. But question. when yeah. you say you map the top net, how do you find them? The what? When you say you map the top net, how do you find them? I mean, how do we find them? That's another really good question because one thing that people don't understand about the dark net is that on the surface net, you have site detection and site crawling, for example. On the surface net, site detection is trivial. It's so trivial we don't even know about it, really, we don't think about it, because you can detect sites easily. But on the dark net, you have a whole step of detecting the site in the first place. You have to know the, the URL of the site. And that, that's another use of cryptography. The URLs are the first 16 letters of the hash of the first 80 characters of the site's public key. So they have these weird, long, nonsensical URLs that end in .onion. And so, you know, first you have to find, nobody knows uh, Playpen. It has a weird, long, you know, URL. Only other people talk about it in chat rooms and things like that. So 
finding them is a whole art in itself. That I will just say is something that is requires advanced technological understanding of, you know, the really complicated drawing I put up there about how hidden services work. A lot of academics work on that for ages, finding little vulnerabilities. Just to find the sites, never mind crawling them. So it's a very complicated area that a lot of researchers work in. Yeah. Um, so for some of us that might be interested in um, looking at job opportunities and forensics like that with law enforcement, um, where can someone start at the entry level or just what suggestions you have? Or what do you know? Well, that's a great question. I mean, law enforcement is a great career, and I, I'm always urging people to consider it and look into it because there are not enough like qualified people in law enforcement. and. You know, people complain a lot about law enforcement, and law enforcement certainly has many areas to criticize, but I challenge everybody to then consider a career in law enforcement, because law enforcement is not easy, and the only way to improve it is for well-qualified people to go into it. In terms of doing forensic analysis, I find it fascinating. It's just an area, it's not my primary work, but it's an area where I spend a lot of time. And in terms of becoming a criminalist, which is the name of the job that does what I do, which is digital extraction and evidence analysis, what we really do is we spend all our time in the lab. Darkening cases is just a small part of what we do. We mainly spend our time analyzing and extracting digital evidence from cell phones and laptops that are confiscated in criminal cases. Your criminal case is arrested this morning. Those devices end up in my lab this afternoon. We crack them by the end of the day and we extract all the evidence of what's going on in there. So in terms of careers, I think that taking classes like this is a really important step in understanding some fundamentals of how things work. And also a great way is to get an internship at a law enforcement agency. Alameda County and San Francisco both have fabulous internship cadet programs. So if you join while you're in school, they even have programs that will pay you to be a cadet to essentially just go after school and learn, really, that prepare you for uh, the police exam and other things for when you get in. So there's definitely a lot of ways to get in. Yeah. Um, with that in mind, are there like conferences like that con like that or specifically for uh, your line of work? Conferences. Well, you know, it's an interesting field because it depends on trade craft, trade secrets, and trade art, essentially. Those are like uh, the technical terms for what they depend on, like it, meaning it depends on, just like any other law enforcement technique, secrecy and techniques. Not that like all law enforcement techniques are so secret, like everybody knows about like undercover operations and stuff, but so they tend to, be somewhat selective and often they're like formally selective. So they don't have like a lot of open conferences that you can go to and join. For example, I belong to the High Tech Crime Investigators Association, but that's a members only organization where you have to be like vetted and they investigate you and check you out and all that kind of stuff. But like I said, you know, the San Francisco police has a cadet option. They pay you to learn. Alameda County has a cadet option, Albany County Sheriff's Office, where you can join the Cadet Academy. You can go get an after, it's an after school job. They're very flexible. They love having, you know, college students. We have some great college students over at Albany County Sheriff's Office. Now, you can work in any lab that you want, and you can learn a lot about crime scene analysis. I mean, another thing I do is I go out on crime scenes and collect digital evidence at the scene and stuff. So I really urge you guys, just log into your local PD look up those um, programs and contact people. It's a great way to, also it's, it's great experience to have. If you're in the security field, having some law enforcement experience is valuable. I'm running the internship program and we have a job fair every semester. If someone could come talk, we probably get a bunch of students doing it. Oh, that's great. When's your job fair? It's uh, the second week of every semester. The next one will be in January, around the end of January. Okay, well I'd be happy to hook you up with some Okay, I'll information send you an email. about that. We should work this out because, yeah, certainly, a lot of students are interested. And we have a program we can get them right in. Yeah, that'd be fabulous. 
Yes. I thought I'd give a plug for um, IACRS, you know, the certification that does the forensic. Um, IAC, yes. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah, sorry. Uh, two, they do two weeks of forensic um, analysis by volunteers from the police department. And every year it's in Orlando, which is nice. That's but, great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And I think a lot of you actually have some law enforcement connections and stuff. I'm in the HTCIA. It's not that hard to get into as long as you're not working on the bench. Right, exactly. Nobody who works on the pen side. Yeah, I mean, and they have events and things, so it's not that hard to get into. Very interesting now. Yes. When you have a big bat, big Faraday cages bags, we scoop up a whole bunch of mobile devices in and take it to the lab. Uh, don't they try to, um, I should know this, don't they try to power range and find uh, find a cell tower and run out of battery real quickly? They absolutely do, you're right. And you know what we have in Alameda County, what most PDs have nowadays is we have Faraday rooms. And they are huge walk-in rooms that are Faraday cages. But well, what do you do to keep them, then you just energize them as soon as you we can? We take the digital evidence, and we keep it in the Faraday bag after we collect it and until it comes to the crime lab through the chain of custody, the proper procedures. And then we bring it into the Faraday room. And typically when we go into the lab in the morning, we go into the Faraday room and shut ourselves in the Faraday room. And then we open the evidence once we're in the room. So we remain locked in those rooms for hours and hours and hours at a time, which can be a very intense experience in itself or whatever when you're like pulling up all kinds of images on cell devices. But technically that's how we do it. But are they going to be discharged even quicker if you're in a shielded tempest room or whatever? Well, they can't, I mean, they can't connect. We, we put them on airplane mode. So they don't, they no longer attempt to connect to the cell tower. Oh. We have a huge collection of power on devices. So we keep the power on. Oh. And before we had the Faraday rooms in the old lab, we had Faraday stations that were essentially cage boxes where we put the devices in and we use, and they have gloves in the side of the boxes, so we use them like that. But the Faraday rooms are much better. Right, skiffs, huh? Pretty much like skiffs, yeah, exactly. Hopefully you can get funding to one of Yeah, just curious, when you guys are doing analysis these days, do you more and more go to try to look at the blockchain of cryptocurrencies to try to find the activity or where the criminals are? Or is it just mostly you know the traffic part of it, like you've been talking about? Digital currency and blockchain is one of the biggest questions that I get, and something that people are very interested in. And obviously, so Jermaine, I bet you guys probably spend a lot of time on currency. I probably come to this class and learn a lot, you know, from it. I think in itself, it doesn't have criminal evidence yet. I mean, that's why they had to go to Coinbase to get records because it's anonymous. Yeah. So, I mean, analyzing the blockchain itself directly is about as tough as analyzing Tor. It's, a, it's the hard way. Yeah, I remember people were going, criminals were going from Bitcoin to Monero, I think I read. Right. But harder, there's more privacy or something. Well, it's, just, it's money laundering. That's the problem. Yeah. It's very easy to launder money over there. Yeah. Exactly. So, it's what we call non trivial. Problem in uh, technological wise. Thank goodness criminals make mistakes and we have good old fashioned police. Work. But, but it's important to understand how it works in order to figure out where that good old fashioned police work might come into play. Whatever. So, but um, cryptocurrency and blockchain is a very, very big um, growing area for law enforcement, definitely. So in the beginning, I was just curious, you mentioned about Putnam Financial Service, but you had a Marshall team? Putnam Investments. Putnam Investments. Well, had a, they had a subsidiary of Marshall McLennan. So they have their data center at the, uh, the, the time. 96 to 99. So was there a business continuity plan? That's an excellent question. Mm -hmm. so I was in charge of disaster recovery business continuity, as well as all other things at the time for Putnam Investments. Mm -hmm. Yes, there was. We had one at the subsidiary, actually. It's interesting. Putnam Investments is a multi-billion dollar investment management company that has mutual funds. And uh, financial services companies are some of the best resourced companies from an IT standpoint. We were owned by Marshall McLennan and insurance company. It's also in the financial services business, but not as profitable as asset management. So, uh, I mean, first of all, we lost hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people that day. 
And we came in in the morning and watched our people jump out the building and die, essentially. And those were at our parent company. We had to recover our parent, essentially. Remotely, we recovered them from Boston that day. And, um, you know, that's a whole other story in itself. At that time, uh, tapes were used for backup. And okay. they found that they had to go six weeks back to get a good set of tapes because tapes are known to have a lot of flaws. Mm -hmm. So they lost a lot of data, and it was a very difficult recovery, but we did recover them. Can I ask, like, I was involved in the enterprise application of this is continuity project. So I'm just curious, in terms of the application-wise, how, what platform, how did you know? It was we had, as you might imagine, for a multi-billion dollar financial services company, hundreds of highly critically classified applications, in addition to thousands of medium and low classified risk applications. Just looking at the high risk applications alone, which are your transaction-based banking, um, insurance, you know, uh, based systems or whatever, um, they were multi-platform. I mean, uh, Marsha McLennan had you know, a data center with over 2,000 servers. Putnam Investments had thousands and thousands of servers. We had everything. We have Windows. We had Linux. We have, you know, in an organization like that, you have a proliferation of high-risk critical applications all running on different platforms. We tested those plans four times a year, and uh, it was a very, very costly program, but nobody really thought that it would ever have to be put into place, and we put it in place that day, and it worked. And you know, Marshall McLennan survived that and is now still a thriving company, but it was a very, very difficult recovery. It was fortunate that the company never stopped running though during that time. What was the lag time from the Dow to for the white race to the off sites for the continuity site? We had um, high availability. So we had T3s and T1s at the time laid that did um, high availability backup to SunGuard and IBM systems that were geographically dispersed around the world. So those failover systems went into place immediately. But interestingly, we at the, um, at the subsidiary company, Putnam Investments was a highly, highly profitable subsidiary of Marshall McLennan, a much bigger insurance company that, as you may recall, was later prosecuted by Elliot Spitzer, a whole other chapter of its history. But, um, it, so we were better resourced than our parent company, and we recovered them, interestingly. Our program was dramatically more advanced than theirs, and as I mentioned, they relied on tape backup, weekly tapes. The tapes were sent off-site daily, but then there was a weekly full backup, and we had to go back six weeks to get a full recovery. But we had the backups up and running within 36 hours, so the company never stopped functioning. Fortunately, it was different, totally different topic, but fascinating topic. Yes. So what did you, what do you think happened with the FBI and the Apple Five S as they're trying to crack from the terrorists? Yeah. The terror, the San Bernardino terrorists. Yeah. What do I think? What do I think? What do I think? Well, we're sort of mysterious. Yeah, how did they get up there? How did you figure it out? Yeah, that's a really good question, isn't it? Well, when we have something hard to crack in the lab, what do we do? Call the Israelis. That's exactly what we do. What is it? Really? Call a vendor. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh, commercial vendors. Yeah. We use commercial vendors in our lab, like all crime labs. We call the vendor. No, and the vendor? Call the vendor. Call the vendor. Call Yep. And they provide what we call custom cracking services. What about all crime shops? You use them? What's that? You use Elcom Soft? We don't use Elcom Soft. Right. But we use a very wide variety of tools in the lab. One thing about law enforcement is that they don't, they're not always highly resourced, but as a result, they're very resourceful. Like looking at open source tools. So they really value people who are nimble and interested in looking at open source tools. But they do have a wide variety of tools and we collaborate with different agencies, have different tools. So they work with each other. It's a rolling process of cracking every device. You know, there are thousands and tens of thousands of different yeah. devices. So, you know, what, what, you know, your local crime lab can crack today, somebody else somewhere has already cracked it. It's just a matter of finding, you know, where that advanced cracker is. 
So this might be not law enforcement space, but it, I'm not sure what to call it. Uh, I'm working with a friend in the Ukraine. There's an ongoing conflict right now. I'm sure you're aware of it. But no basically, way. in the Ukraine? Yeah. But basically, he's trying to do a study on how Russia has their own agents. And would you say that uh, there's been concrete evidence of a country using the Tor network? to talk to their agents in foreign countries. Is there evidence of people using a Tor network to talk to their agents in foreign countries? Specifically countries. <coughs> Let me say nations. Talking to foreign well, I mean, you know there's Tor relays in Russia, right? And there's Tor relays in the Ukraine. There's Tor relays in 91 countries around the world. And um, I mean, there's certainly a lot of evidence of a lot of bad things going on involving Ukraine and Russia. Well, and you know that Snowden used Tor to exfiltrate, you know, his data, and he's now in Russia. Yeah. So, I mean, is there is there evidence of people using Tor for bad things? Yes. Well, well, I think it was the original stated design goal of Tor, so your spies can phone home. Exactly. That's, that's common. That's one of the exact yeah. original uses. And all the criminals are just providing cover for the spies for their people. That, very well put. Yeah, That's yeah. an excellent way of putting it. You want more criminals because they're providing cover. I mean, are the spies good or bad? It depends on where you sit. I mean, yeah. I hope that my intelligence agencies, I depend on them, frankly, for my safety, protecting me against a lot of threats out in the world. But how do I feel about other intelligence agencies? By the way? Not too great. Some people fear they feel they have the most to fear from our own government agencies spying on us. And surely there could be improvements in that area. But, you know, that's like a wide debate, yeah. Um, so ever since the big Equifax pack, there have been all of these LifeLock commercials for like, protecting your identity. And I've heard them say something where they like scan the dark web every night, every day, every hour to like see if your identity is being sold. <laughs> 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 yeah, I heard that too. Yeah. I work with the inventors of that. The tour every day. I've worked with them for years, and all the people on I like to think at the leading edge of this analysis. We all know each other well, so we all know who's doing what and who's not doing it. And nowadays, you hear more and more commercial companies claiming that they're doing this. I mean, briefly, they are not. First of all, but there are companies that are starting to try to crawl the dark net and selling commercial services. Um, a lot of them go on IRC chat, and they do very labor-intensive manual targeted investigations. However, there are a couple of companies now that do do darknet crawling, and I work with them as well. So, um, but Equifax is definitely not one of them. Um, or LifeLock. LifeLock. Or LifeLock. Yeah, maybe we should let her go. We can't keep her here all night. Yeah, you got it. So with the I read recently that the FCA is going to pass the net neutrality bill. Would that change uh, usage of Tor for, for better or worse? I mean, net neutrality is so big, right? That's like a huge topic. I mean, it would certainly impact Tor. I think there's probably other more critical you know, um, implications about net neutrality. But it's certainly something that people in this class would all be really interested in. Right? Yeah. All right. Yeah, I think we better. Thank you so much for inviting me to your class. You have a lot of really Let's good questions. Oh, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. So, oh, well. all we got to do is stop it, and then I think we can post it. It'll be on YouTube. Mm -hmm. I can certainly do it. And right. I think it's so small we can even email it. That's one amazing thing about this.